Hey, welcome to my guide to internal medicine for third year medical students. I'm going to be going over all the high yield PIM questions that you're most likely to get asked on this rotation and also the most important information that you need to know in order to get honors. This is going to be applicable to both internal medicine and family medicine because there's a lot of overlap and we have a lot of material to cover. So I will be going pretty quickly, but hopefully you can review things or leave a question in the comments below if you need further clarification. First of all, I'd like to start off with six questions that you can ask patients at any time while they're in the hospital. And for internal medicine, it's basically just kind of a review of systems. Uh, did you have any fevers or chills overnight? Any chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting? And did you have a bowel movement? And then one bonus question is that I really like asking uh, about patients' hobbies. I feel like this is a very underrated question to ask, but it immediately helps you build rapport with your patients because they feel like you're expressing interest in them. And sometimes you actually do really find useful information with this question as well. Next are three additional things I wanted to talk about is that one, don't underestimate the review of systems. I feel like in medical school, I didn't think the review of systems was that useful, but now as a resident, I've come to realize the strength and how useful it is. When you really don't know what's going on, just doing a full head to toe systems review can sometimes really clarify what's actually going on with the patient. And then all patients need a med rec on admission or a med reconciliation. That's because internal medicine and in family medicine, patients are on a lot of medications. And so you, we need to go through all of the medications and ensure that we know exactly what meds they're taking at home so that we can properly give them the meds that they need while they're in the hospital. So as a medical student, this is one of the most important uh, and helpful things that you can do for your residents is doing a thorough med rec because it's a very time consuming process and it's actually very helpful when a medical student can do that and that can be very helpful for your team. And then finally, uh, social history is really important and I think this is also something I underestimated during medical school, but knowing where a patient lives, what their baseline functional status is, like are they able to ambulate on their own or do they need a cane or a walker? These are very important questions to know early on because it helps you plan for where the patient is eventually going to discharge to or what we call dispo. So let's just get right into it. There's a huge uh, number of different conditions that I basically came up with uh, off the top of my head that we see frequently in internal medicine, but I'm just gonna kind of choose the high yield ones that are most important and that you're most likely to encounter on your rotation in internal medicine. So first one is gonna be atrial fibrillation. This is the most common arrhythmia and just getting straight into it, um, I like to teach medical students a mnemonic for causes of atrial fibrillation and that mnemonic is the pirate's mnemonic. So P is for pulmonary or post-op, I is for ischemia, for example, acute coronary syndrome, R is rheumatic heart disease, A is anemia, T is thyroid, E is electrolytes and uh, ethanol, and S is for sepsis. So these are some of the most common causes of atrial fibrillation. And what are the two major complications of atrial fibrillation? So why do we care so much about if a patient has atrial fibrillation? What are the bad things that can happen in patients with this? And the one that you really need to know as a medical student is that AFib is really a huge risk factor for stroke. Uh, and then the other complication you should know about is what's called RVR or rapid ventricular response, where your uh, heart will start just beating very rapidly and this can cause hemodynamic compromise. But definitely you need to know that stroke is the big thing we're worried about with atrial fibrillation. And what is the location that thrombi typically form? So what happens in atrial fibrillation is your atria are just kind of fibrillating and so the blood kind of pools there and is very stagnant and so you get a blood clot and eventually that blood clot can shoot off, go into your blood vessels, go into your brain and then cause a stroke. So that's how it works. And one common PIM question you'll be asked is where do these blood clots form? And the answer to that is gonna be the left atrial appendage. What is a score that we can use to estimate the risk of stroke? This is very huge and something I didn't know when I was a third year medical student uh, going into my internal medicine rotation. Uh, but this is gonna be the CHADS VASC score and you definitely need to know this because it's gonna come up a lot. And basically we calculate a risk of stroke based on several risk factors, for example, congestive heart failure, hypertension, age greater than 65, diabetes, stroke, vascular disease, age greater than 75, and sex category, basically meaning if you're female, you get an extra point. And if your score is greater than two, that is usually an indication to anticoagulate or put a patient on a blood thinner uh, to prevent the risk of stroke. And then on the flip side, we have a score that estimates the risk of bleeding if we do start a blood thinner or anticoagulation. And that's gonna be the has blood score. But in terms of the scores you need to know, you definitely, definitely need to know the Chad's VASC score.
what medications do we use to treat atrial fibrillation? So as I mentioned before, we use a blood thinner. Um, but the other one that we use is kind of to prevent this RVR, uh, and that's going to be rate control medications. So the two main classes of medications, rate control medications like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, and blood thinners like warfarin or rivaroxaban, apixaban, things like that. So a couple landmark trials. If you can know these trials and talk about them during rounds, you're going to look like an all-star in front of your team and in front of your attendings. And that can really help you get honors. But there's a landmark trial that showed that rate control is equal to rhythm control. And that was called the AFFIRM trial. And basically, the reason we favor rate control is because the rhythm control actually had a trend towards increased mortality and they had uh, higher side effects. So usually we start with rate control. And then another important trial that showed that going for a lenient rate control goal of heart rate less than 110 is better than strict heart rate control less than 80 is the race two trial. And so these are two trials that I think if you can say in front of your team, you're going to really you know, impress uh, your team overall. Next, let's talk about treatment for AFib in a patient who is hemodynamically unstable. So in anybody who is unstable, blood pressure 60 over 40, they're in rapid AFib with RVR, the answer to this is gonna be cardioversion. You're just directly gonna shock them out of the rhythm. Uh, and then if a patient has prolonged AFib with RVR and then they start to develop congestive heart failure from this, uh, what is that called? This is a PIP question that I got as a medical student and that's called tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy. Next, let's move on to acute coronary syndrome. And there are three different types of or classifications of acute coronary syndrome that you should know. And that's gonna be uh, unstable angina, n STEMI and STEMI. And the big thing is that you need to know what differentiates unstable angina from n STEMI and STEMI. And so unstable angina is going to see no elevation in the troponin level, whereas n STEMI and STEMI do. And this is a little graphical depiction of some of the differences. Unstable angina, n STEMI and STEMI. Uh, the big difference you see here, unstable angina, you do not have a troponin elevation. How long does it take before troponin starts to rise after an MI? This is another common question that you might get, but it actually takes about four hours for troponin to rise. And this is why if somebody acutely comes in with chest pain uh, after like an hour, they may have a negative troponin. And if their history is concerning enough, you're gonna be trending EKGs and troponins just so you make sure you don't falsely discharge somebody because they have a negative troponin. It may just not have peaked or, or ro risen yet. And then what treatment should immediately be given if suspicious for MI, that's going to be aspirin, 325 milligram load, and then 81 milligrams daily. Uh, other treatments we often give is going to be a lipid uh, lowering agent like atorvastatin and anticoagulation like heparin. And then what are the three different types of treatments for MI? This is basically going to be we can do medical management for it, or we can do a stent or also known as PCI, uh, where we go in and deploy a stent that opens up the blockage in the blood vessel. And then finally, we can do surgical intervention with a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. And then what history finding is most specific for acute MI? This is actually going to be radiation of pain to the right arm. Typically, we learn that the pain will radiate down the left arm, but actually studies have shown that if a patient reports pain radiating down the right arm, that's actually more specific for MI compared to the left side. And this is a trick question you might get on your rotation. Uh, if a patient has chest pain with tenderness to palpation of the chest wall, or if it's reproducible with palpation of the chest wall, this is code for uh, thinking that it's something musculoskeletal or costochondritis. And so if somebody's having acute coronary syndrome, they shouldn't get pain with palpation to their chest wall. And then there are three features of typical chest pain that you should know about. That's gonna be substernal chest pain that's worse with exertion and relieved with rest or nitroglycerin. And the reason it's important to know these three typical features is because we have some different definitions. So um, if you meet three out of three of these criteria, that's called typical chest pain. If you meet two out of three, that's called atypical chest pain. And then if you meet zero to one out of three, that's called non-cardiac chest pain. Okay, and so that's what the answer to this question is right here.
Finally, if a patient has elevated troponins and signs of ischemia, but you don't think it's from acute coronary syndrome, what do we call this? So say somebody is in septic shock, their blood pressure is 70 over 40, they've been hypotensive all the time, uh, febrile and just really sick, and they have elevated troponins. The answer to this is gonna be what we call a type two MI, or what is also known as demand ischemia. And I remember as a medical student, people would throw this term out and I didn't really know what they were talking about, but this is what they mean uh, when they have, they're having an infarction, they're having elevated troponins, but it's not due to a primary ACS event. Next, let's talk about COPD, one of the most common diagnoses we're gonna be treating in the hospital. So there are only two treatments that reduce mortality in COPD, and this is an important question that you're likely to get asked, and that's gonna be oxygen supplementation and nicotine cessation. So stopping smoking is very important. What is the goal oxygen saturation in these patients? That's gonna be a goal O2 sat of 88 to 92%. And the reason we don't aim for a higher goal is that giving patients with COPD too much oxygen is actually a bad thing. And why is it bad? This is another common question you might get. And uh, what a lot of people will tell you is, oh, it's because COPD patients start to use hypoxia as a drive of their respiratory rate rather than uh, you know, us without COPD, we use carbon dioxide to determine our respiratory rate. So too much oxygen will cause decreased respiratory drive. That's the most common answer people will give. But the real reason is actually not decreased respiratory drive. The real reason is actually reversal of hypoxic pulmonary vasculature. And that sounds very confusing, but I'm going over this because this is gonna be on your board exams, it's gonna be on your shelf exams, and you're gonna get pimped about this. And the real answer is reversal of hypoxic pulmonary vasculature. So basically in COPD, you have areas that are obstructed and that are not well ventilated ventilated. So what happens is you have blood vessels going to those areas and the COPD patients will constrict blood vessels there to reduce blood flow to places with poor ventilation. Now, if you give tons of oxygen to this patient and now they're satting 100%, well, uh, now these blood vessels are, go are going to dilate because there's sufficient oxygen in those areas, but those places still have very poor gas exchange because they're still obstructed and poorly ventilated. And this can actually cause uh, paradoxically them to go into respiratory failure. So what is the typical progression of inhaled treatments for COPD? This is a really nice one to know, uh, just to know like how severe somebody's COPD is. So for COPD, we usually start with a long-acting muscarinic antagonist like teotropium, and then we move on to a long-acting beta agonist like salmeterol, and then finally inhaled corticosteroids. Interestingly, for asthma, we do basically the exact opposite. So we start off with an inhaled corticosteroid, then we go to a LABA, and then we go to a LAMA. And the other thing is that all of these patients should have a short-acting beta agonist like albuterol uh, ordered for PRN use when they're having wheezing or feel like they're having a bit of a flare. What are the criteria that define a COPD exacerbation? There's gonna be two main criteria that we look for, and that's gonna be change in sputum, either the amount or the quality, and then increasing dyspnea or shortness of breath. And then what is a nebulized treatment that we often give in the hospital for acute exacerbations? That's gonna be what's called a duoneb, and I'm just putting this here because you know we hear, we throw this term all uh, out all the time, but what it really is is ipratropium and albuterol. So this is a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, and this is a short acting beta agonist. What medications do we give to actually treat the COPD exacerbation? The answer to that is gonna be steroids and azithromycin. And how long do we give steroids? That's gonna be five days, and this is based on the REDUCE trial, which compared five days of steroids versus 14 days of steroids, and found that the five-day group actually had better outcomes. And then why is azithromycin often useful for COPD exacerbations? The answer to this is that it's thought to decrease inflammation in the airways and really help uh, recovery uh, during a COPD exacerbation. And then what is the indication to start oxygen in COPD? So say somebody has COPD, but they've never been on oxygen before. When do you decide to start oxygen at home for them? And that's gonna be if their oxygen saturation is less than 88% or if their PaO2 is less than 55. And then this is another important question, not only for real life scenarios, but this comes up on the boards a lot. But say there's an asthma or COPD patient who starts to look worse, but when you listen to them on physical exam, 
Shazam, their wheezing is actually gone now, and their PCO2 rises to 40, which is kind of the normal value of your carbon dioxide. The answer to this, uh, you know, what's going on here, is that they have impending respiratory failure, okay? So you, you notice that they're looking worse, but the reason their wheezing goes away, that does not mean they're improving. That actually means that they're moving such little air at this point that you don't hear the wheezing anymore because they have such low airflow at this point. And so these patients are going to be very dangerous and maybe needing intubation soon. And then what is a type of non-invasive ventilation that you can use before intubation? That's going to be BiPAP. And I just want to uh, let you know this is important because BiPAP is different from CPAP. BiPAP provides ventilation, which means it can blow off carbon dioxide. Okay. But CPAP only gives oxygenation. It does not give any ventilation, so it has no effect on the PCO2. And, oh, and one more question. What is the FEV1 to FVC ratio that defines obstructive lung disease? You might get asked this. And the answer to that is going to be an FEV1 FVC ratio less than 0.7. Now let's move on to cirrhosis. So what are the complications of cirrhosis? There's a whole slew of complications and it's gonna be hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, a variceal bleed, or hepatorenal syndrome. And then any patient that comes into the hospital with one of these complications is said to have what kind of cirrhosis? We call that decompensated cirrhosis. So triggers for decompensated cirrhosis, the most common trigger is gonna be medication non-adherence, but there's there's definitely a lot of other uh, possible causes. Infections and bleeds are definitely ones we need to rule out. And then even, even electrolyte abnormalities and over diuresing somebody can cause somebody to go into decompensated cirrhosis. And so what is our main treatment for hepatic encephalopathy? That's going to be lactulose titrated to two to three bowel movements per day. This is something that frequently is going to get asked on your medicine rotation. How much do we want patients to be pooping when they're on lactulose? And then you can also add rifaximin if a patient is refractory. And then another thing that I wanted to add is another frequent PIMP question is what is the mechanism of action of lactulose? And so what happens is lactulose is a sugar and it gets digested by bacteria in your gut. And when they digest it, they actually release acid into your colon and helps acidify the colon. And and what happens after your colon is acidified, there's more H plus ions around. And so ammonia, which is NH3, will get turned into ammonium, NH4 plus, which is not absorbed by the colon. And so basically you're reducing the total body amount of ammonia because you're making it into this like non-absorbable form in the gut uh, by acidifying the colon. So another important uh, question that you might get pimped on uh, during your medical school rotation. So what are the different stages of hepatic encephalopathy? That's going to be stage one, which is just characterized by sleep disturbance. And then two to three is when you start getting asterixis and you also start to get confusion. And then four would be if a patient is basically comatose. What is the treatment for ascites? So really, we're going to have one medication treatment and then one kind of procedural treatment. The medication is going to be spironolactone and furosemide in a 5 to 2 ratio. This is an important ratio to know. So usually you'll see something like 50 milligrams of spironolactone and 20 of Lasix or 140, something like that. And then procedurally, we can do what's called a large volume paracentesis if a patient is very distended and very symptomatic. So any patient with ascites and fever needs to be ruled out for what condition? The answer to that is going to be SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And then there are two types of paracentesis. This is a PIMP question that I got wrong during my medical school rotation. Uh, and that's going to be a diagnostic paracentesis and a therapeutic one. So diagnostic is when you're just going to be taking like 50 cc's out of their abdomen to make sure they don't have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Therapeutic is going to be you're taking like 5, like 10, 15 liters out to kind of treat uh, symptoms from how much fluid is in their belly. Okay, what are the diagnostic criteria for diagnosing SBP in acidic fluid? Uh, this is a very important question that you're very likely to get asked, but what we're looking for is PMNs or neutrophils greater than 250. And if you see that, then you can diagnose SBP. Next question is how can you tell if ascites fluid is from portal hypertension or another etiology? Uh, another PIMP question that I got wrong during medical school, uh, but this is gonna be the SAG that we've learned about, the serum ascites albumin gradient. And basically you just look at the albumin value in their blood and compare it to uh, the albumin value in their ascites. And if it's a large gap greater than 1.1, that indicates a portal hypertensive etiology. Here's a nice little table 
example here that shows that SAG greater than 1.1 is going to be your cirrhosis and portal hypertension etiologies. And then SAG less than 1.1 is going to be nephrotic syndrome, uh, malignancy, pancreatitis, tuberculosis, all of these things here. Next, what is the treatment for a variceal bleed? That's going to be octreotide, ceftriaxone, and a proton pump inhibitor. And you also need to make sure that they have two large bore IVs and that you consult GI for possible banding or clipping off of those variceal veins. And then beta blockers is only going to be used for prophylaxis, so you don't use it in the acute setting when they're bleeding uh, because they need to have some com compensatory tachycardia. So beta blockers is only after everything's stabilized, and then you add beta blockers to prevent future bleeds. Next is a very important question you might get asked is, what is a procedure that can reduce the risk of a variceal bleed by decreasing portal pressure? That's gonna be the TIPS procedure. And basically what this does is you're bypassing the liver and you go into the hepatic vein and just bypass it and go straight into the IVC. And that reduces portal pressure and reduces your risk of variceal bleed. The problem with TIPS, and this is another common question you'll get asked or pimped on is that there is an, uh, there's a complication that usually gets worse with TIPS and that's uh, worsened hepatic encephalopathy. So imagine you're now shunting everything away from the liver and so it's not processing and it's not getting rid of the ammonia. You're going to have higher levels of ammonia in your body and then get worsened hepatic encephalopathy. More on cirrhosis. So is AST and ALT a marker of liver function? The answer to that is no. This is a marker of liver damage and inflammation but not function. So even though we call it the liver function test, there's actually more useful markers of liver function and the transaminases themselves are not really a marker of liver function. What are the actual measures of liver function? That's going to be your PT and INR because remember your liver helps make all those coagulation factors, your bilirubin, your albumin, and your platelet level. And then what's, what is a score that is used to determine the degree of cirrhosis and the need for transplant? That's going to be the MELD sodium score, another important score that you should know about. And basically, Basically, if this score is greater than 15, that's when you start thinking about transplant for these patients. Now let's talk a little bit about acute liver injury. So there are two patterns of liver injury that you really need to know, two broad categories of liver injury. And the reason it's important to know this is because there's a different differential diagnosis for both of these. So you have a hepatocellular pattern of liver injury and a cholestatic pattern. And hepatocellular is going to be your AST and ALT. Uh, significantly elevated, and then your ALKFOS and Billy are only kind of mildly elevated. And then the opposite pattern is going to be seen with cholestatic, where you have more of a predominant ALP and a Billy elevation and a lower AST ALT elevation. What are the main conditions that can cause AST and ALT in the thousands? Another common PIM question. The way I remember this is uh, Vade, because there was actually a doctor at my medical school called Dr. Vade, uh, and her name was basically a good mnemonic, uh, which is viral hepatitis can cause AST and ALT in the thousands, autoimmune hepatitis hepatitis, ischemic or shock liver, and then drug-induced, which is one of the most common causes. And then what is an antibody for autoimmune hepatitis? You should definitely know this. This is going to be the anti-smooth muscle antibody. And an antibody for primary biliary cholangitis, this is going to be the anti-mitochondrial antibody. And then what is the criteria for defining acute liver failure? There's actually only two criteria that you need, and that's going to be encephalopathy and an INR greater than 1.5. And if somebody meets the criteria for acute liver liver failure, then you need to consider if they need emergent transplant. Now let's move on to congestive heart failure. So what are the different classifications of CHF? So we have systolic heart failure, also known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with moderately reduced ejection fraction, and diastolic heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. And basically, if you want to do a quick review, uh, systolic is when you're going to have that eccentric hypertrophy. So you have a really thin left ventricle, and it just kind of balloons out and gets really weak and doesn't contract very well. Whereas diastolic is you're going to get hypertrophied uh, left ventricle and it becomes very tight and very difficult to fill and so both of these are going to cause decreased cardiac output and lead to heart failure symptoms so again this is going to be eccentric and then diastolic heart failure is concentric hypertrophy. And what are the ejection fraction cutoffs for the above conditions? So systolic heart failure is gonna be an EF less than 40%. Moderately reduced EF is gonna be 40 to 50%. And preserved EF is gonna be greater than 50%. And we're gonna go over this in a second, but it's important to know these different cutoffs because the treatments actually vary based on whether they have systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure. So there are two broad categories of why somebody may have systolic heart failure. 
And that's gonna be ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So ischemic is gonna be the person with hypertension, smoking, obesity, diabetes, and they have a heart attack, and now they have a weakened heart muscle, and that's why they have systolic heart failure. Non-ischemic is typically gonna be people who are doing drugs and get a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, or uh, people with viral cardiomyopathies and now have decreased function from that. This is a little bit above medical student uh, knowledge, but uh, the reason this is important is also because our treatment approaches to ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy also differs pretty much based on what the etiology of their heart failure is. And now the next questions are going to get to why we define systolic heart failure versus diastolic heart failure. So there are treatments with mortality benefit in systolic heart failure, and you are definitely going to get pimped about this. Um, but the answer to that is going to be beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and spironolactone. And then also, if you want to go above and beyond, SGLT2 inhibitors, ICDs, cardiac resynchronization therapy, and BIDIL in African-American populations have also shown to have mortality benefit. And then on the flip hand, what are treatments with mortality benefit in diastolic heart failure? The answer to that is actually gonna be none, okay? That's what your attendings are gonna be looking for when they're pimping you on this question. And that's not entirely true because there are some more recent studies that show that spironolactone and maybe SGLT2 inhibitors do have mortality benefit in diastolic heart failure, but when you're attending asks you, the real answer is going to be there are no uh, mortality benefit treatments for diastolic heart failure. And the answer is going to be we need to treat the underlying condition. And the underlying condition of diastolic heart failure, the most common one, is going to be uncontrolled hypertension. What is a physical exam maneuver that has the highest sensitivity for volume overload? This is gonna come up on your board exams and also uh, just uh, something that your attendings might ask. This is gonna be looking for JVD. In practicality, it's actually very difficult to see JVD, at least in my experience, especially with how obese a lot of patients are. Um, and so what really we do in practice now is you'll see a lot of people start looking at the IVC on a point of care ultrasound and seeing if they have a very dilated IVC, that's a sign of volume overload. What is the lab test with the highest sensitivity for CHF exacerbation, another board exam question. That's gonna be a BNP. And then there are BNP cutoffs that can essentially rule out if somebody's having a CHF exacerbation. And usually if the BNP is less than 100, they're probably not volume overloaded significantly enough to be causing CHF exacerbation. And then really common PIMP question that I just came across so often during my third year medical school rotation, but what is a reason that BNP may be falsely low in obese patients? That's gonna be because adipocytes degrade BNP, and so your obese patients have a lot of adipocytes, and so they're gonna degrade it, and it may be falsely low. What is the goal, potassium and magnesium, in patients that are being diuresed? That's gonna be a potassium greater than four and a magnesium greater than two. And so this is typically something that you will be doing in your heart failure patients. Uh, we'll be replacing the potassium and magnesium a lot. And the easy way to remember this is is that for every 10 milliequivalents that you give, you are going to raise their serum potassium by 0.1. So for example, if somebody's potassium is 3.5 and you gave them 40 milliequivalents of potassium, you would expect their uh, repeat potassium to go up to 3.9. For magnesium, it's for every one gram, you're gonna go up by 0.1. So if their magnesium is 1.7, then you can give them three grams and that should raise them up to two. This basic conversion is something very useful for you to know because it comes up very frequently. And then how much Lasix should you give for a CHF exacerbation? That's gonna be two to 2.5 times the home dose. And this is based off the dose trial. And typically what we do is say that somebody is on 20 milligrams PO Lasix daily at home. Then what we normally do is we just kind of convert it 20 milligrams IV Lasix because IV Lasix compared to oral Lasix is already kind of like a doubling of the dose. And then finally, very, very common pimp question is how long does Lasix last? And that's gonna be six hours. So Lasix last six hour. That's basically why it's called Lasix. Now let's do a quick overview of diabetes. So what is the goal glucose range while hospitalized? That's gonna be 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter per the NICE sugar trial. And this is because when we do a tighter control in the hospital, we increase the rate of hypoglycemic events. So usually we have a more lenient goal while patients are hospitalized. And then what outpatient diabetes medications should you continue while inpatient? The answer to this is usually none except insulin. And the reason is there are a few side effects of oral diabetes medications that people are worried about when patients are hospitalized. So what are people worried about when using metformin in patients with renal impairment? That's going to be lactic acidosis. Now studies aren't very good for this, but it's just a theoretical fear that a lot of people have. 
And then why do we hold most outpatient oral medications on admission? So fear of hypoglycemia, if you're giving sulfonylureas or um, anything that kind of is like an insulin secretagogue, uh, pancreatic issues with GLP-1 and DPP-4 inhibitors, euglycemic DKA is a, a feared complication of SGLT-2 inhibitors, and then heart failure with pioglitazones, which I don't see very commonly. Uh, but these are some of the reasons that we're a little bit more hesitant to give oral medications while they're admitted. I remember as a medical student, I never knew why we were holding all their outpatient medications. So this is the reason. Now, what is a newer medication that has mortality benefit and heart failure with reduced EF? We kind of went through this already, uh, but this is going to be the SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is a drug class that is really, really gaining a lot of favor in diabetic patients. What is the goal A1C in most adults? This is another important question to know. But usually we're just gonna target an A1C less than 7%. And if they're elderly, we're gonna aim for less than 8%. You know, diabetes is officially diagnosed when your A1C is greater than 6.5%. How come we don't aim for less than 6.5%? Well, there were some trials that showed that strict A1C goals, less than 6%, was not better than a lenient goal of less than 7 to 8%. And that was the ACCORD trial. And so that's why we don't try to really strictly control people's blood sugars because that increases the rates of hypoglycemic events and worsens outcomes. Does good control of blood glucose reduce macrovascular complications? For example, stroke, heart attack, things like that. The answer to that is actually no. So even if somebody's A1C is 10%, you get it all the way down to 7%, they are still going to have an elevated risk of stroke and heart attack. What it does uh, reduce is microvascular complications such as peripheral neuropathy, retinopathy, and also nephropathy. So treatment of DKA revolves around a few key treatments, and that's gonna be fluids, very aggressive fluid hydration, because these people are gonna be very volume depleted, insulin, and potassium, because a lot of times their whole body potassium depleted as well. And then what are some findings in the urine and serum of uh, DKA patients that can help diagnose that they're in a DKA episode? That's gonna be urine ketones, so that's what we're gonna look for on urinalysis, and then serum beta hydroxy butyrate. What value do we trend while treating patients with DKA? So we're going to be looking at their basic metabolic panel. And what we're looking at is we're looking at their anion gap and we're waiting for that to close. So basically, if you remember your BMP, you have your sodium. So let's say they're 135 and you have potassium, say they're four and chloride 110 and say their uh, bicarb is 10 and their creatinine and BUN is 50 and two and their glucose is 400, okay? So the way to calculate the anion gap is gonna be the sodium minus the chloride minus the bicarb, okay? So in this case, it's gonna be 135 minus 110 minus 10 equals 15. So this person does have an elevated anion gap. Usually our anion gap that we're looking for is an anion gap less than 12 is normal, okay? And so we continue giving insulin and fluids until we close that anion gap and make sure that it's less than 12. Now let's talk about endocarditis. So what criteria do we use to diagnose endocarditis? Very common PIM question. This is gonna be the Duke criteria. And the Duke criteria is listed as here. I'm not gonna go through them too much. Um, but some of the things that we see with endocarditis are immunologic phenomena and vascular phenomena. And I think a lot of times attendings love to pimp on the physical exam findings of endocarditis. So immunologic phenomena are include things like Roth spots in your eyes. It's basically these little hemorrhage and white spots in your eyes. And then what's called called Osler's nodes on your hands. And the vascular phenomena include splinter hemorrhages and Janeway lesions. And the way to differentiate another common PIM question, Janeway lesions from Osler's nodes, is that Osler's nodes hurt and they're painful, whereas Janeway, uh, and so you can remember that as Osler's nodes, and then Janeway lesions are not painful. Why do we have to keep repeating blood cultures for gram-positive bacteremia? So the reason, the answer to that is that gram-positive organisms are typically a little bit more stickier and they're harder to clear from the body than gram-negative. So if you have a gram-negative E. coli bacteremia, for example, you can usually just give antibiotics and you don't necessarily need to check a repeat blood culture to make sure it's cleared from the body. But if it's staph aureus or strep or staph epidermidis, then you need to make sure that the blood cultures have cleared before you say somebody has been treated.
And then now let's move on to GI bleed. So what is the first vital sign to change in acute GI bleed? This is an important question. It's gonna be the heart rate, not the blood pressure, which a lot of medical students will get wrong. And then all patients with GI bleed need two what? We went over this earlier, but that's two large bore IVs. And what size defines a large bore IV? That's gonna be 18 gauge or larger. And so basically you have like 22 gauge, 20 gauge, 18 gauge, 16, 14. So the lower you go, the larger the IVs are getting. Um, uh, whereas the higher you go, the smaller, okay? So you need two 18 gauge or larger uh, IVs. And then can you give rapid fluid resuscitation through a central line? Another common PIM question to medical students. The answer is usually no. So if you remember the law of Laplace or whatever the resistance equation was, when you have a very long catheter, you're gonna have huge amounts of resistance. And so these central lines is usually, you know, going in an internal jugular vein or going through a pick line, a peripherally inserted central line. And they are very, very long catheters that go all the way down to the heart. And so there's a ton of resistance. And so you actually can't give huge amounts of fluid um, rapidly through those just because of how much resistance there is. Now, what is the cutoff point for upper and lower GI bleed? Very important question. And this is going to be the ligament of trites. And so anything above the ligament of trites is an upper GI bleed. Anything below the ligament of trites is a lower GI bleed. What are presenting symptoms of an upper GI bleed? This is going to be melena, hematemesis, and coffee ground emesis. And then symptoms of a lower GI bleed is going to be usually hematochesia. And the big differentiating thing that I want you to know is that if you see a patient with melena, that suggests upper GI bleed. And if you see hematochesia, bright red blood per rectum, that suggests lower GI bleed. Very important for you to know as a medical student. Next question, does diverticulosis or diverticulitis bleed? The answer to that is diverticulosis bleeds, whereas diverticulitis hurts. So diverticulosis is, gonna, again, that outpouching in the colon. What it does is it kind of erodes the area where the superficial blood vessels are, and so it's prone to bleeding. Diverticulitis is kind of when it gets inflamed and infected, and that really hurts, but usually is not associated with bleeding. So diverticulosis is the one that bleeds. Treatment approaches to an active lower GI bleed. This is a pimp question that I got wrong, so I just threw it in here. But you can either do colonoscopy with banding, so you're going to clip off those areas that are bleeding, or you can do a CT angiogram, look at the blood vessels and see where the blood is extravasating from, and you can do an IR embolization to stop that bleeding blood vessel. Now, what is the transfusion goal for hemoglobin? Very important question that you're going to get asked. And this is going to be uh, if patient's hemoglobin is less than 7, then that's usually our threshold for uh, transfusing. Transfusion goal for platelets is going to be usually if the platelets are less than 10,000, then we are going to transfuse. If they're actively bleeding, then we usually transfuse if it's less than 20,000. And if they're pre-op, you know, getting ready for a procedure, sometimes we have a higher goal of 50,000. And the reason that we transfuse once the platelets are less than 10,000 is usually that has a risk of intracranial hemorrhage, spontaneous brain bleed. Uh, so that's why we transfuse if it's that low. What is a lab value that you can check on the basic metabolic panel that can be elevated in a slow GI bleed? That's gonna be the BUN. Uh, there's a lot of nitrogen in blood and your blood um, gets digested in the GI tract. So it can really elevate your BUN. That's something you can look out for. Now let's talk about sepsis. So what is the cutoff temperature for defining fever? That's gonna be 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. What are the SERS criteria? You should definitely know this. It's gonna be temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and white blood cell count. And interestingly, there's a new set of criteria that helps predict mortality from sepsis, and it's supposed to be more accurate than the SERS criteria, and that's gonna be Q-SOFA. So this is something that you might get asked about. The criteria for this includes altered mental status, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. And then what was the old definition of sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock? Uh, definitely a lot of old school attendings are gonna be asking something like this. So uh, sepsis is two plus of SERS plus a suspected infection. And then if you have signs of organ damage, then you call it severe sepsis. And then finally, septic shock, what differentiates septic shock from uh, severe sepsis is that you have hypotension that is unresponsive to fluids. Okay, so this is described here. Now the thing is, with the new sepsis guidelines, we've kind of removed the severe sepsis category. So now we just have sepsis and septic shock. So that's something that's a little bit new now. Next question, when you're drawing blood cultures, how many sets of blood cultures should you get? We usually get two sets of blood cultures because sometimes you can get false positives or contaminants. So we get two just to make sure that we have an accurate uh, blood culture. And then how much fluid do you typically give for sepsis? That's going to be 30 cc's per kilogram. This is per the surviving sepsis guidelines, but this is now outdated. But if your attending asks this, 
then you should definitely know that usually our goal is giving 30 cc's per kilogram. Now it's a little bit more individualized, but uh, the answer to your atten attendings question is going to be 30 cc's per kilogram. And then what are the four key components of treating sepsis? That's going to be fluids, antibiotics, source control, and pressors. So definitely need to get those fluids and antibiotics started ASAP. And then source control is like if somebody has an abscess and you're just giving antibiotics, you're not actually getting source control on that infection. You really need to target that area that's infected and drain that abscess in order to really treat it. Because if you just give antibiotics, it's not going to be sufficient. Now let's talk about pancreatitis. So how do you diagnose pancreatitis? Very important set of questions. So you need at least two out of three of the following findings. You need typical symptoms. So that's going to be epigastric abdominal pain that radiates to the back. You need a lipase level that's greater than three times the upper limit of normal. And you need radiographic evidence. For example, a CT scan showing inflammation around the pancreas. So you need two of those three criteria, and then you can diagnose pancreatitis. And the most important aspects of treating pancreatitis, there's two main treatments that we're going to be using. That's going to be fluids and pain control. What are the two most common causes of pancreatitis? The answer to that is going to be gallstones and alcohol. Very important question for you to know. And a common mnemonic for other causes of pancreatitis is going to be the get smashed mnemonic. I don't actually know the whole mnemonic off the top of my head, but one common pimp question that you're going to ask is what is a very weird, unique, or odd cause of pancreatitis? And the answer to that is going to be scorpion bites is a very rare but interesting cause of pancreatitis. Should patients with pancreatitis be made NPO? The answer is no, you should advance their diet as tolerated. The prevailing thought in the past was you should allow bowel rest to make sure you're not secreting you know, pancreatic enzymes and causing more inflammation, but the studies have shown that actually advancing diet as tolerated has had improved outcomes compared to making people on full bowel rest. And then are antibiotics indicated for pancreatitis? The answer to that is generally not. And what are scoring systems for predicting mortality from pancreatitis? That's going to be the BICEP and the Ransons criteria. So BICEP stands for BUN, impaired mental status, SIRS criteria, age, and pleural effusion. And then why might hemoglobin and BUN be elevated in patients with pancreatitis? So what happens is they're releasing all these digestive enzymes and these digestive enzymes are super irritating and they cause blood vessels to become very leaky. And so what happens is you get profound hypovolemia from capillary leak. And basically all their fluids just like third space. And so it concentrates all the things that are in your blood, like your hemoglobin and your BUN. Now, why might calcium be low? This is a PIM question that I got. And this is because those pancreatic enzymes actually bind to calcium in a process known as saponification. Now let's talk about pneumonia. There's two main types of pneumonia that you should know because our treatments kind of vary for these. And that's gonna be community acquired pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia. So what are some scoring systems that determine if a patient needs to be admitted? That's gonna be the CURB-65 and the pneumonia severity index. And what are typical antibiotics that we give for community acquired pneumonia while patients are admitted? That's gonna be ceftriaxone and azithromycin. That's the most typical regimen that you're gonna see. And then what if a patient has a risk factor for MRSA? What are you going to add. You're going to add vancomycin. And if they have a risk factor for pseudomonas, you're going to use cefepime or piperacillin tazobactam, also known as zosin, instead of ceftriaxone because it has anti-pseudomonal coverage. And then if you suspect ESBL, so extended spectrum beta lactamase, now we have to upgrade even higher. That's going to be using carbapenems, which have activity against ESBLs. There is only one carbapenem that does not cover pseudomonas, and that's going to be erdapenem. Uh, the advantage of erdapenem is that it's once daily dosing. So erdapenem is kind of different from all of the other carbapenems. And then what is the definition of hospital acquired pneumonia? Very important question. That's going to be any pneumonia that develops greater than 40 hours after admission. And usually when somebody develops hospital-acquired pneumonia, we automatically start them on pseudomonal coverage because they have a, that's basically a risk factor for pseudomonas. So they'll usually start on cefepime or zosin based on your institution, and then plus or minus vancomycin depending on the MRSA rates at your hospital as well. And then do you need anaerobic coverage for aspiration pneumonia. This is something that, you know, we have a lot of anaerobic flora in our uh, oral flora. And so when you aspirate, uh, you know, people ask, oh, maybe we need to add metronidazole to cover anaerobes. The answer for that is no, based on the 2019 IDSA guidelines. The only reasons you would add metronidazole would be if there's an abscess or an empyema is suspected. Because if you think about it, the lungs are an aerobic environment. So anaerobes are not gonna survive anyways. Only if there is a walled off abscess or a focal fluid collection can anaerobes actually be able to survive.
Now let's talk about UTI. So what are UA findings that are suggestive of UTI? That's gonna be leukocyte esterase, nitrites, white blood cells, and bacteria. So leukocyte esterase is basically an enzyme that white blood cells uh, produce. So that tells you that white blood cells are active right now. And then nitrites are kind of like this enzyme that bacteria release. So that's another sign that you might have a urinary tract infection. And then one other thing is that if you see squamous cells on your UA, that indicates that the sample is potentially contaminated. It wasn't a very good clean catch. Uh, so sometimes it might not be as accurate. Now, should asymptomatic bacteria urea be treated? So you see a patient, E. coli is greater than 100,000 colony forming units, but they have no dysuria, no suprapubic tenderness, no symptoms at all. The answer is no. The only time we really treat it is uh, pregnant patients because they have worse outcomes if you, treat, if you don't treat their bacteria urea. And then uh, most common organism causing a UTI, this is a good PIMP question for medical students, and that's gonna be E. coli, and then other gram negatives like Klebsiella and Serratia. And then what is a typical antibiotic that we use for treating UTI while inpatient? That's gonna be ceftriaxone, gives a lot of that good gram negative coverage. And then if there's a risk factor for pseudomonas, kind of like with uh, pneumonia, we're gonna upgrade to cefepime or zosin for the anti-pseudomonal coverage. And then how do you define complicated UTI versus simple cystitis? So Complicated UTI is basically saying that there's uh, signs of infection past the bladder, whereas simple cystitis is confined only to the bladder. So whereas with simple cystitis, you may have some suprapubic tenderness, you may have some dysuria or urinary frequency, complicated UTI is gonna be defined when you have a fever, uh, chills, flank pain, which and CVA tenderness, which would be concerning for extension up to the kidneys, like pyelonephritis. And common antibiotics that we use to treat simple cystitis as an outpatient, that's gonna be nitrofurantoin, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or Bactrim. And then common antibiotics used to treat a complicated UTI as an outpatient. That's going to be something like a fluoroquinolone. And so the fluoroquinolones are kind of like our big guns as an outpatient regimen. And a fluoroquinolone that does not provide good UTI coverage is going to be moxifloxacin. The ones that we would use instead is going to be ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin, both of which have good urinary um, penetration. Now let's talk about hyponatremia, the internist favorite talk. Um, but people think that, you know, this is a lot of like mental masturbation and we're not really, you know, we're just talking about what the etiology of hyponatremia is and it's really useless. But actually it's very, very important to know what the etiology of hyponatremia is because the treatments completely differ based on what the etiology is. So that's why it's actually very important to know uh, hyponatremia. So first of all, uh, what is the mnemonic for remembering the danger of overcorrecting hypo or hypernatremia? That is gonna be low to high, pawns will die, or osmotic demyelination syndrome, and high to low, brains will blow, cerebral edema. So for example, sodium was 110, and then in 24 hours you corrected it to 135, then you're worried about osmotic demyelination, and then in this scenario, uh, you know, sodium was 160 and you corrected it to 140 all of a sudden, then you're worried about cerebral edema. Very useful mnemonic to know. How do you differentiate acute versus chronic hyponatremia? That's gonna be less than 48 hours is acute and greater than 48 hours is chronic. And the reason that's important is because for acute hyponatremia, less than 48 hours, you can correct it right away and not have to worry about osmotic demyelination. Now, what is the goal correction rate for chronic hyponatremia? So we wanna be a little bit more gentle to prevent osmotic demyelination. That's gonna be about six to eight milliequivalents per day. And then what is the first thing to assess after seeing a patient has hyponatremia? So this is a very common uh, question that you might get asked. It's also gonna be on your board exams. And also you'll see it in all these algorithms for diagnosing the etiology of hyponatremia. So if you see a patient comes in, sodium is 120, what do you wanna look at first? The first thing you look at is the osmolality. All right, so there's three possibilities. You can have a hypertonic osmolality, you can have isotonic, and then you can have hypotonic. The reason this is important is because the differential completely differs. So the most common cause of hypertonic hyponatremia, you know, say your osmolality is like greater than 295, the most common cause of that is gonna be hyperglycemia. And then the most common cause of isotonic, so if your osmolality is like 285 to 295, is gonna be pseudo hyponatremia. And what pseudo hyponatremia is, is basically it's a lab error, um, and usually due to too many proteins uh, or too many lipids or triglycerides. And then finally, if you have hypotonic, which is less than 285, uh, well, we'll go into that in a little bit. So a patient presents with glucose 500 and sodium of 126. This is another uh, important question, but we have to correct their sodium for their degree of hyperglycemia. So what is their true sodium? So the way to do this is that for every 100 glucose above 100, add two 
to the sodium. So this person uh, has four 100s above 100, right? So you do four times two equals eight. So you do 126 plus eight equals 134. So that's what their sodium is gonna be after doing correction for hypoglycemia. Very common thing that you may have to do while you're in the hospital. Okay, so next question is the next thing to assess after determining a patient has hypotonic hyponatremia. This is the most common cause of hyponatremia that we see. And now we wanna look at their volume status, okay? And this is super, super important because it totally dictates our treatment. So I'm just gonna do a very superficial discussion, but if a patient has hypovolemic hyponatremia, our treatment is usually gonna be fluids. If they have euvolemic hyponatremia, it's gonna be usually fluid restriction. The most common cause of this is gonna be SIADH. And then finally, if they have hypervolemic hyponatremia, our treatment is gonna be diuresis. So this is really the crux of why it's so important to know what the etiology of hyponatremia is. Because our treatments vary so much between each of these different etiologies. One, we give fluids. One, we hold fluids. One, we try and get rid of fluids, right? So when people come into the ED and people just blind give fluids for hyponatremia, a lot of times they cause worsening of their hyponatremia. So you really need to think about what their actual etiology of hyponatremia is. That's why we spend so much time thinking about why they have hyponatremia. Finally, what are the most common causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia? That's gonna be CHF, cirrhosis, and nephrotic syndrome. All these different uh, conditions that can cause whole body volume overload and cause low sodium levels. Now, these are the two algorithms that I really like. This one is from American Family Physicians. I just, every time I wanna look it up, I just go to Google Images and I just type, type AFP hyponatremia algorithm. And so this really shows you, first we look at the osmolality. We see if it's hypertonic, then it's probably hyperglycemia. If it's normal, then it's probably pseudo hyponatremia. And if it's low, then we go down and we check their volume status. Hypovolemic, we usually give fluids. Euvolemic, we usually do fluid restriction. And hypervolemic, we usually do diuresis. Another super helpful one that I've uh, also liked and kind of comes at it from a different perspective is the clinical problem solvers uh, algorithm for hyponatremia as well. Okay, let's talk about hyperkalemia. So what is the first test that you wanna get if the potassium is high? That's gonna be an EKG. The first EKG finding of hyperkalemia is gonna be peaked T waves. And the next EKG finding of hyperkalemia is gonna be widened or prolonged QRS. And then finally, if you continue to not treat their hyperkalemia, what's gonna happen? They're gonna develop a sine wave and then they're gonna progress into ventricular fibrillation, asystole, or pulseless electrical activity, they're gonna die. So that's why we check an EKG because we wanna see how much these high potassium levels are actually uh, impacting their uh, cardiac conduction. Now, what is a treatment that we give to stabilize the cardiac membrane? So if you see any EKG changes, then we immediately give this treatment. It's going to be calcium gluconate. And then finally, we have some temporizing measures that are useful uh, to lower the potassium levels temporarily. And that's going to be insulin plus D50, sodium bicarbonate, and albuterol. So how this works, insulin, again, works through the sodium and potassium ATPase. So you give them both insulin and D50 to make sure they don't get hypoglycemic, but the insulin drives potassium into cells. The same thing happens with sodium bicarbonate. So if you're making their pH of their blood more alkaline, what happens is that H plus ions in their cells will go out into the blood to try and make it more acidic again. And then that's, they need to be exchanged for another positive ion so the potassium will go back into their cells. And then albuterol also works with the sodium potassium ATPase and causes shift of potassium into cells. But again, these are only temporary measures that only last for about one to four hours. So instead, we need to do treatments that actually permanently get rid of the potassium, and that's going to be things like Lasix, because you're going to be peeing out the potassium, uh, Lokelmer or Kaexalate, which are basically potassium binders that go through the GI tract, and then finally dialysis. You know, if somebody's got very high potassium levels, 7.5, got lots of EKG changes, and you're not going to be able to temporize them, then they just need emergent dialysis. So what is the framework for different causes of elevated potassium? Uh, this is going to be electrolyte shifts, excess intake or release. Um, usually this is going to be you know, rhabdo, you know, cells are lysing, tumor lysis syndrome, cells have a ton of potassium in them, so it can cause hyperkalemia. And then poor excretion, this is usually going to be renal failure, kidney failure, not able to pee out that potassium, but also constipation can cause hyperkalemia as well.
Now let's talk about acute kidney injury and dialysis, very important topics to know because so many of our patients come in with acute kidney injury. So what is the definition of an AKI based on the creatinine level? So this is an important question to know. AKI is defined by a creatinine greater than 0.3 from their normal baseline or greater than 50% of their baseline. So if their creatinine is normally one and it comes in at 1.2, they're not quite at an AKI level yet, but if it's 1.3, then you would de define that as an AKI. And then how long should creatinine be elevated before you call it chronic kidney disease? So now it's progression of their kidney disease. That takes three months. So if now he's been at 1.3, and it's just for the next three months, it just stays at 1.3, it never goes down. Now that's his new baseline and we call it CKD. There are three categories of AKI. It's a nice framework for determining uh, what the cause of their AKI is. And that's gonna be pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. Very important question that you're very likely to get pimped on. And then what is a lab test that you can use to help differentiate pre-renal versus intra-renal AKI? That's gonna be a FINA, fractional excretion of sodium, or FE urea if a patient is on a diuretic. Uh, honestly, the studies regarding these are actually not that useful, but this is something you can definitely get asked about on your internal medicine rotation. And then what are indications for dialysis? Huge, huge question that you're going to get asked all the time. That's going to be A, E, I, O, U, basically all the letters of the alphabet. So A is for acidosis. If their pH is 6.9, you need to dialyze them. E is for electrolytes. Usually this is hyperkalemia. If their potassium 7.9, you're going to EKG changes. Like we mentioned in the last slide, uh, then you need to dialyze. I is for ingestion of toxic or intoxicants, any like toxic things. Uh, o is for overload. If they're severely volume overloaded, they're not making urine, then you need to dialyze and get that volume off. And then U is for uremia. So if their BUN is like 100 plus and they're uremic, they're encephalopathic, that is a indication for dialysis. What is the type of imaging we're concerned about getting in patients with AKI or CKD? That's gonna be any imaging that uses contrast uh, because there is a concern that contrast can cause AKI uh, by causing vasoconstriction. And what happens is a patient goes in, gets a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast, and then we see an AKI a few days later. So the, the typical timing for contrast-induced nephropathy is really gonna be two to three days. And how much of a creatinine rise is expected after starting an ACE inhibitor? That's gonna be up to a 30% increase in their creatinine. And then is a creatinine increase from one to two or three to four more significant? This is an important question you might get asked. So um, I'm gonna just show you uh, how one to two is a lot more significant and a lot more worrisome compared to three to four or even three to five, you know, something like that. I'm not as worried as, you know, one to two. So this is a graph of your GFR compared to your creatinine level. So say your creatinine is one, so if we trace it all the way over here, then your GFR is like 100. Now if you go from one to two, now all of a sudden you've dropped your GFR from 100 to 20. If you go from three to four, you've basically only gone from 17 to like 15. So you can see how changes in creatinine at lower levels has a much bigger impact on your GFR than if somebody already has very high creatinine. What is the most important marker of kidney function? So we talk about creatinine all the time, but truly the most important marker of kidney function is gonna be looking at the patient's urine output because that's really gonna tell us how the kidneys are functioning. Now let's go do a hodgepodge of different questions, antihypertensives, DVT, PE, and aortic stenosis. So what is the goal blood pressure for outpatients? This is really nice to know. The goal is usually gonna be less than 130 over 80. This is per the SPRINT trial, um, which showed that less than 120 over 80 was good. But then there's this ACCORD trial, which showed that less than 140 over 90 was good. So now they kind of just took the middle of that and now it's like less than 130 over 80. And then if they're more elderly, you can be a little bit more lenient because we wanna prevent episodes of hypotension. What are the three first line antihypertensives? Very important to know. ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and thiazides per the ALHAT trial. And then importantly, not beta blockers. Okay, beta blockers are not considered a first line antihypertensive. They're actually, actually pretty bad at controlling blood pressure. And what is a triad of risk factors for developing DVT slash PE? That's gonna be called Verkau's triad. So that's gonna be hypercoagulable state, uh, venous stasis, and endothelial injury. And then what is a score that we can use to evaluate the likelihood of PE? These are important scores to know about. It's gonna be the Wells score and the PE rule out criteria. And so PE rule out criteria, if they score zero on this, you can officially rule them out for uh, PE. Uh, if not, then you can use the Wells score to risk stratify, are they a low risk of PE or a high risk of PE? And then next we can get a lab test that can help us assess the risk of PE. And that's gonna be a D-dimer. So D-dimer is basically a byproduct of clot degradation. So if there's a clot, you'll see an elevation 
elevated D-dimer, which could be uh, suggestive of a PE or a DVT. But one important question that people always, always, always ask medical students is, is D-dimer useful in patients with a high well score? So these are patients where you have high suspicion of PE, okay? And is D-dimer useful? The answer is no. D-dimer is only useful in lower scores, uh, less than four, in order to rule out the need for a CT scan to look for a PE. And so this makes sense because if you have high suspicion for a PE and then you get the D-dimer and it's negative, you still have a high suspicion of PE. So you're gonna progress to that, you're gonna go to that CT scan anyways. The only situation in, in which it's useful is when you have a low well score, that means you have a low suspicion for PE and then you get a D-dimer, which is negative, which confirms that you have a low suspicion, okay? So that's, you only get D-dimer if it's a low well score. Uh, part of the well score is unilateral leg swelling, and that is defined by a greater than three centimeter circumference compared to the other leg. And then what is the medication we use to prevent DVTs in hospitalized patients? That's gonna be Lovenox or heparin if patients have renal impairment. And then there's a name of mechanical methods of DVT prophylaxis. So we like strap these things on patients' legs and basically massage their legs and squeeze to try and promote blood flow. And that's gonna be SCD or IPC, a sequential compression device or intermatic pneumatic compression device. Um, and the evidence for these is not super great, but it's better than nothing because sometimes we can't put patients on heparin or Lovenox or any blood thinner. Next, what are the three cardinal symptoms of aortic stenosis? Uh, very important question to know, uh, but this is gonna be angina, syncope, and heart failure. And then what is the mortality rate of aortic stenosis after you develop the above symptoms? So angina has a five-year 50% mortality, syncope has a three-year 50% mortality, and the development of CHF has a two-year 50% mortality. And then does the loudness of the murmur correlate with the severity? These are all pimp questions that I got asked when I was in medical school, but the answer is no. So if you hear a very, very loud crescendo, decrescendo murmur, that does not necessarily tell you how severe the uh, aortic stenosis is. Um, instead, there are other physical exam characteristics that are suggestive of more severe AS, and that's gonna be a late peaking murmur, a diminished S2, and pulsus parvus et tardis. Now let's talk about general healthcare maintenance. Last slide, almost there guys. So influenza vaccination is gonna be yearly. Pneumonia vaccination is gonna be for all adults greater than 65 plus, but if they have a lot of these comorbid conditions, uh, then you usually do 21 plus. So if they're a smoker, heart failure, diabetes, alcoholism, and then there's a whole slew of other uh, conditions and also uh, different vaccinations that we use, different timings of the vaccinations, but in general, all adults over 65 plus or 21 plus if they have different comorbid conditions. Tdap vaccination is gonna be every 10 years. Shingles vaccination is gonna be at age 50 plus. Colon cancer screening is gonna be a colonoscopy starting at the age of 50 all the way up to 75. And you need a routine one every 10 years. The main exception for this is if you have IBD, then you get your first colonoscopy after eight years after diagnosis, and then every one to two years after that. And then if you have a family history of colon cancer, then you do 10 years before your relative got colon cancer or age 40, whatever comes earlier. So for example, if your relative got diagnosed with colon cancer at age 44, then you would have to get your first colonoscopy at age 34. If your uh, relative got uh, colon cancer at age 53, then you would get your first colonoscopy at age 40 because age 40 is earlier than 10 years, less than 53, which is 43. Okay, osteoporosis screening is recommended as a one-time DEXA uh, after the age of 65 for all females. And then breast cancer screening is gonna be from age 50 to 74 with a mammogram every two years. And a risk benefit discussion, um, if they're higher risk, you can start screening at the age 40 as well. Cervical cancer screening is gonna be ages 21 to 64 with a pap smear every three years or a pap plus HPV test every five years. Lung cancer screening is very important one to know because you might get asked about this. But this is from ages 55 to 80 with a 30 pack year smoking history and they're currently smoking or quit in the last 15 years. So very important that we only get a CT scan to screen for lung cancer if they have this 30 pack year smoking history and if they're a recent or currently smoking person. And then abdominal aortic aneurysm screening is gonna be any man who is a smoker uh, between age 65 to 75. And then diabetes screening usually is gonna be at age 45 plus, but 
any patients with comorbid conditions like hypertension, obesity, other risk factors, um, and Asians usually get screened a little bit earlier too, uh, then those are indications to screen earlier. But otherwise, age 45 plus, everybody should get an A1C. Prostate cancer screening. Uh, recently, the USPSTF had recommended against uh, prostate cancer screening routinely, but now they've changed it back to a risk-benefit discussion. So this is uh, between men age 55 to 69. And keep in mind that African-American men are at higher risk. So I highly recommend when you're doing your outpatient family medicine or internal medicine rotation, you really need to review uh, the USPSTF uh, guidelines, which give all the guidelines to routine screenings that we do as outpatients. All right, and that is it for my guide to internal medicine for third year medical students. If you made it this far, congratulations. It was a long one, and I hope there was a ton of high yield information in this present presentation. And I'm sure that this is gonna help you get a lot of PIMP questions right on your uh, rotation, because I know these are all the questions that I had gotten asked and I thought were high yield and important for you to know. If you have any questions or comments, definitely leave them down in the comment section down below, and I will 100% respond to them and answer any questions that you guys have. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you like this content, you want more things, please let me know what you want to see in future videos. Like and subscribe if this video was helpful for you and you want to see more content like this in the future. And thanks again for watching. Peace.